Hello and welcome to BitGardener's Office Hours. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, today's topic is color theory. Um, if you're unfamiliar with our office hours format, we've been doing it for some time, but uh, to catch some folks up, it's a shortened presentation, usually 20, 25 minutes um, on a particular topic, followed by um, uh, questions, discussions, uh, anything uh, that we can help you with uh, out in the audience. Um, so if you have a question, comment, um, like our, our speaker to elaborate on anything, um, just enter it in the chat box. Uh, it should be in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And uh, Noah, we're picking up some uh, static here on your uh, microphone. Is everything okay now? Yeah, seems to have settled down. Thank you. Um, today's speaker, uh, Noah Morgan, he's an application specialist here at BitGardener and um, will be presenting today and is a wealth of knowledge. So if you're, like I said, if you're experiencing anything at one of your facilities, one of your processes, would you like him to um, explain something a little further? Don't hesitate to, to drop it in the chat. Um, also, we are recording this, um, including the discussion. So uh, if you, you know, immediately following, you'll get an automated email um, with that link. Feel free to, to check us out uh, at a later date, grab some screen grabs, uh, share it with colleagues, um, use it however you'd like. Um, any of those automated messages too, if you think of something after the fact, you can always hit reply and it'll come to my team and we'll route it to the right technical expert. So uh, with that, Noah, it is all yours, sir. All right, thank you everybody again for joining. So today we'll be talking about color theory, uh, particularly how we perceive color, um, why it's done that way, and the history behind it. All right, so moving on. Uh, so in order to perceive a color, there's three main things that we need um, in order to establish that. So we need a light source, we need the object in question, and we need an observer. So in order to identify what our luminant is, which is our light source, we first have to look at, you know, what range do we need? So to quantify a color, we want to look at the entire spectrum of visible light. Um, and what that is, it's 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Um, and this is what our eyes can pick up as color. Um, and so we see here on the slide, 400 nanometers is the purple section. Um, and it goes all throughout the colors of the rainbow all the way up to the red end at 700 nanometers. Um, and so what this is important is, you know, with these illuminants and these light sources, we need to identify um, what range in order to establish that color. So with that, we have standard illuminants. Um, and we can see here our first illuminant is D65, D standing for daylight, and 65 means 6,500 Kelvin, uh, which is the intensity of that light source. And what this is supposed to represent is natural daylight outside. Um, and so we see down here in this image, we have a picture of outside. Uh, we also have A, which is tungsten light. Uh, that's typically what you'll find in your normal household. And we see the spectral curve changes, and it's it's very intense on the red end of the spectrum, uh, whereas the purple and blue end it's, it's fairly low. So what that means is, if you have a red object, it's going to be, appear a lot more vibrant um, under that A tungsten light. Um, now we also have F2, which is a fluorescent light, and that's mostly you'll find that mostly in stores. Um, and we see these very large spikes in purple, blue, and green. Um, so if you have, say, a purple shirt or a, or a blue object in a fluorescent light, it's going to pop out more than a red object in the, under that light source. Um, and we, when we look at the D65 light source, we see that it's almost flatlined all the way across the entire spectrum. Um, so that's really ideal when we're looking at objects that we have perfect amount of light across all the spectrum of color. So why do we have standard illuminance? 
Uh, the main reason is because we're trying to find and identify metamerism. Uh, what metamerism is, is if you have an object under, let's say, D65 daylight, uh, when you take that object and move it under a different light source, then that object color change. So you'll see in this example, we have a match between these two objects under D65, but when we bring them under uh, a tungsten light, we then see a mismatch. So what that could represent is that there's a pigment inside that light source, or there's a pigment inside that object that gets excited by that high range in the red spectrum. And it's gonna make that object pop more under that tungsten light. Uh, whereas under the daylight, there's not enough uh, red wavelength in order that hits that object to change the color as drastically. So this is important um, in manufacturing when we have different panels that are getting outsourced to different uh, suppliers or different, um, just different things that come together to form an object that a consumer would purchase. If they see something under daylight and they purchase it uh, under daylight, when they bring it home and bring it into their house, they suddenly see that one side doesn't match the other side uh, when it should. So this is why we have main standard illuminance. So we talked about the light source. Uh, so now we want to talk about the observer. So to understand an observer, we want to look at how our eyes actually perceive color. So inside of our eyes, we have cone cells and rod cells. What these cone cells are is they identify color. So those are our color detectors. Um, and they're mainly for red, uh, green, and blue. And we also have these rod cells and what these rod cells are, they're lightness detectors. So in combination, both the cone cells and the rod cells help us to perceive color. So determination of color sensitivity. Back in nine, or the early 1900s, there was two scientists named Wright and Guild, and they ran an experiment to combine three light sources. So we had red, green, and blue, um, which match the cone receptors or the rod, yeah, the cone receptors in our eyes. And we also had a regular light source that was, in this case, a, a purple color. What they did was they looked through a small aperture and were able to view both sides. So they viewed the purple side, which was the color, and they used the red, green, and blue color, uh, lights in order to replicate what they were seeing on the other side. And so they combined these two in order to identify how we perceive color. And with this, they developed uh, two fields of view. So they found that um, a two degree observer was the best for looking at smaller objects because our eyes focused more on these colors at the two degree observer. And that's because we have more cone cells at the back of our eye than we, um, and it's, it's more concentrated in the two degree angle. Uh, when we look at the 10 degree observer, which is what's more well known and used today, um, we see color more, not based off of just the colors, but now we add in the lightness and darkness aspects. And that's important because it doesn't take just colors in order to see and perceive a color. We also take into account the lightness and darkness of that color. And so that's why a 10 degree observer is widely used today in most industries. This is important because the two degree observer and the 10 degree observer can change how these colors are measured. So say we measure an object in a two degree observer, uh, we see represented in this graph here, the two degree observer is the solid line. And we see at different spectrums and different wavelengths it's very different from what that 10 degree observer is. So a lot of times people can run into issues if they have an instrument measuring with a two degree observer and they have another instrument measuring with a 10 degree observer. What they'll find is that their numbers won't match up when they're testing. And this is because they're using different observers. So we have the light source and the observer. Now we wanna go into the object and what the object's properties and how that can affect how we perceive a color. 
So the interaction between light and an object. Um, so here we have an example of a sample. Uh, we have three different things that happen when light hits an object. We have the gloss, and what that is, it's essentially the incident light, which is the light source hitting the object at a certain angle, and then coming off of that object the exact opposite side of the angle. And that's gonna be our gloss measurement. At the same time, we have absorption, and absorption is when uh, incident light is being absorbed into the sample, and it's, it's then scattered around the sample. And then we also have diffusion. And what diffusion is, is when the incident light comes in and hits the sample and then gets scattered around and eventually diffuses from the sample. And that's what we see color as. Our color um, perception comes from that diffusion. And then a better example here, uh, we have the incident light, which is all the colors in the rainbow, hits an object. All the colors of the rainbow that are not the color that we perceive the object as are then absorbed into the sample. And then we see diffusion happen between the pigments of that material. And then we, the diffused reflection then comes out of whatever that material color is. Now we also see that specular reflection or that gloss here. Um, so as the incident light comes in, we see a specular reflection come off at the opposite angle of where that incident light is coming from. Um, so those are essentially the properties of, of how an object is giving us a color. So with objects and colors, we then have spectral reflectance curves. Uh, what that is, is you can think of it like a fingerprint of a color. Um, so up here we have a blue mug, and we can say that this is the spectral reflectance curve for that blue uh, cup here. Because what we see is that it's pretty low among most of the, the colors in the wavelengths, except for that blue region. In that blue region, we see a large spike. Um, and that's what gives it that blue color. Uh, same with the red, where we see it's, it's fairly, fairly small throughout most of the spectrum. Um, it's a little bit higher in the blue area, but it's, its maximum peak is in the red area. Um, so that's going to give us a red color. And the same with the green and the yellow, we see the highest point of that specular curve is in that green region. So that's gonna give us that green color. Um, and then with the yellow, the same goes there where most of the spectrum is fairly low until it hits the yellow area. And that's where we see that highest point. So now that we have those three aspects, we have the illuminant, the object, and the observer, how do we turn that into a color in order to quantify what a color is? Um, so back in the day, the color scales of X, Y, and Z were used, um, and that was pretty much the first color scales that were used uh, in an early system in order to identify colors. Now, since then, we have moved on to a system called the CIELAB system. This system was developed in 1964. Uh, what that is based off of is the L value, the A and the B, um, and then later on there was the LCH values added. And so with the L, we look at lightness. So at zero, it's completely black, and then up to 100, it's, it's completely white. Um, now we also look at the A value, which is a red-green scale, so at negative A, it's green, and at positive A, it's red. And then we look at the B value, which is uh, negative B is blue, and positive B is yellow. And so in theory, all colors can lie somewhere within this three-dimensional graph here. And you can think of it like a large sphere, and that's considered color space. Now we also have LCH, which is a different system. Um, usually meant for more chromatic colors. So we have lightness, which is the same thing almost. So we have a, a lightness value of zero, which is completely black, and then a lightness value of 100, which is completely white. And then we have our new value, which is C, and that's our chroma or our saturation. Um, and what we see here is that as we further get further and further away from zero, our chroma value gets higher and higher. And so we're looking at our chroma value, and then we also add in our hue angle. 
And so our hue angle starts on the A-axis, at the red side, and then it goes counterclockwise 360 degrees. And so we can identify exactly where we are in a color that's highly chromatic uh, based off of the LCH values. And then this is just an example of how we would identify where a color is with the LAB system. And so we see we have our sample, which is this orange color here. And what we're looking at um, is our LAB, LA and B values. So we have an L value of 58.12. So it's fairly in the middle. Um, we also have an A value of 30.41. So that brings us to the red side. And we have a B value of 36.26. So that brings us a little up to the, the yellow side, which gives us a nice orange color. Now from there, a lot of times in most applications, we see a delta E being used. Uh, what the delta E means is it's just the difference. So instead of having all these different numbers to compare different materials and different samples to each other, uh, what, what CIE wanted to do was create an equation that would take into account all three of these values and then just give us one value that we can look at to say, hey, this, this is passing our spec or this is failing our spec. And that's where delta E comes in. So we see here, delta, this is our delta E equation. Um, so what we have is the square root of L, the square root of A and the square root of B all times together. Um, and so what that basically is, is it's the sample minus the standard. And so we see we started with our sample um, here. Let me see if I can share my pointer. So we started with our sample towards the middle. And that's, we would say that's our standard there. And what happened was our, our new sample was measured and it had a higher A value and it had a higher B value and a higher L value. And so now we're looking at that total, that total difference between that sample and that standard, and that would give us our delta E value. Um, and from there, that delta E value can be put into different specs, and we can get tolerances based off of that. And then from there, we can find out if our sample passes or fails based off of that standard initial LAB value. And with that, that was a, a fairly short presentation. Uh, but with that, if anybody has any questions, feel free to log it in the chat. And uh, John, I give it over to you. Noah, can you hear me okay? Okay, Noah. I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, great. All right. Sorry about that. Silence had some headphone issues. Um, but uh, first question in here, and I, I flip back to the the slide. Um, why is the blue green more pronounced and the red yellow more different? Yes, a good question. 
Um, essentially, this this is subject to change. So, uh, as I said before, the specular reflectance curve is is just the fingerprint of a color. Um, this is just an example here. So, uh, you could find that you know another yellow sample would be almost the same as the green, but that peak would be in the yellow. Um, and same with the red sample. It's this is just uh, it's it's just an example of it um, in the field. You know, you could have completely different curves, but this is just the curve of these particular two examples. Okay. Does that help, Julie? You can, or we can have Noah, Noah continue. Um, okay. So, you know, and you talked about metamerism. What are the some of the causes of meta, metamerism? Is it, you know, something that's in the material? or um, you know, that the lighting picks up. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, so with metamerism, like I said before, um, it's essentially when two objects match under one illuminant and then in a different illuminant, they completely mismatch. Um, now, what could be the, the, the problems that you see where they can arise from is if you have, say, two different manufacturers making the same product, um, and they're getting different sources from different or different material from different sources. And when they come together, we see a mismatch under these colors. And that's usually caused by pigmentation. So there could be an issue with the formulation of that, that paint or that, uh, that color or the pigmentation. Um, and then what you'll see is, say, one pigmentation then gets excited by a different illuminate like A, because A has a very high value in the red end of the spectrum hmm. um, compared to d65 light where it's it's fairly st straight across um, but the red end of the spectrum is fairly low whereas the red end of the spectrum for a light is very high so what you'll see is when that a light is shined on that object the object will be more vibrant in the red color uh, but you won't see that under d65 light yeah gotcha makes sense so i mean so it's the the pigments the formulation of the you know coating or paint or ink or, or whatever that is it could also you know have something to do with the additives yes absolutely okay good excellent um i'm gonna flip back to your main discussion thing um you you talked a little bit about 045 versus sphere. Can you touch on that again? And then, you know, go into kind of what industry standards, um, I know not everybody fits in those standards, but you know, what certain industries gravitate to 045 versus what gravitate towards sphere um, uh, technology? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 045 is, is essentially the measurement geometry. Um, of how most color instruments work. And there's also another geometry called D8 or sphere. Um, the difference between the two is that in 45-0, it measures as our eyes will see a color. So when we take a measurement, we're gonna get values that represent exactly how our eyes are, are looking at that object. Uh, versus a sphere instrument, a, fear, a sphere instrument is not gonna take into account the gloss. Um, so usually it's yeah. using applications where uh, the gloss is not looked at as important when we're just trying to compare um, pigmentation. So, mm. for example, if we're working with raw material and we want to make sure our raw material is matching the same pigmentation and the same color, we're going to use a sphere instrument. Uh, that way we know exactly if our color is, is matching or not, but we're not going to take into account the surface structure or how it's looking because it's going to eventually change and turn into a different shape or different texture. Uh, when we're looking, when we're using 45-0 measurement geometry instruments, we want to see exactly how a finished product is going to look to a customer. So we want to match things according to how we're, we're visually going to see that color. Okay, no, that helps. And if, so, so basically, if gloss and texture um, have a, you know, are of something of interest, you're going to look at the 45-0. Is that right? 
Exactly. Yes. Okay. So you can think of, yeah, you can think of gloss as essentially um, a measurement of texture in a way. So if you have a matte surface, a matte surface is really just micro textures um, that are scattering the light that's cast on the object. And so if you're going to look at um, a finished product or, or something that consumers are going to purchase, you want to look at it with a 45-0 instrument because it's going to show you exactly how that finished product is going to look to our eyes. Okay. Okay. So, you know, not only are you looking at color measurement, but you also have to take that gloss measurement into effect. And if you're dealing with texture or grain, that's yet a third measurement, correct? Uh, yes, exactly. And that that's all, you know, important for not only instrument inner instrument agreement, but also reproducibility and re, you know, just to create that same thing over and over. So that's, you know, the point of all of those measurements. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, I know we talked a little bit about lighting too. What, um, in a, an industrial or a manufacturing setting, you know, how would you go about, you know, viewing a, a, uh, a sample, you know, that's, that's off the line. Um, you know, what are the, the, I guess, recommended processes? Is it instrumentation? Is it visual um, analysis as a combination of both? Yeah. So, and I'd say in most industries, it, it sometimes is a combination of both. Um, okay. What you'll find is historically it's, it's been used as visual. Um, so that can be done with like a, say a light booth which essentially casts a defined illumination uh, over an object. And usually you'll have people that will sit there and, and analyze the differences between two different objects and see if they match. Uh, but that takes time and time is money these days. And so it's slowly moved to instrumentation, which can give us exactly the correct values um, rather than someone's input of, of, you know, this looks a little redder, this looks a little yellower. Um, and so it, it takes away that, uh, that guesswork out of it. And it's a lot quicker as well. Um, and you, what you'll see a lot with like, you could say automotive is, you know, you'll still look at it under defined illumination to see if everything is matching correctly. Um, but that's only after you take measurements um, and you see a discrepancy between two measurements and they take it out and put it in the special room, which is, uh, surrounded by luminaires, which casts this defined illumination over the vehicle. And then that's when they go and analyze to see if the parts are matching visually or not. Um, but usually what they'll find is if there's a, uh, an issue with the measurements where the measurements are lining up correctly, uh, they'll see that visually. Um, and so the data will correlate. Okay. Good. Um, you know, up, up here on your slide, fluorescent colors, how, how does that play into this, you know, in terms of color measurement and also gloss? Yeah, absolutely. So fluorescence is, is a new measurement, like you could say, with a lot of industries. Uh, what you'll see is, you know, a lot of products these days are, are adding more, getting more fluorescence in them. Um, and, you know, it pops to the consumer. But some of the issues that lie within fluorescence is fluorescence is always going to decrease. And so that can come from weathering, that can come from sun damage. Uh, over time, you'll find that the color will completely change over you know, a course of five to 10 years um, until at the end of its life, it's, it's almost completely unrecognizable from the original color that it was made as. Um, so what one of our instruments does actually is it measures the fluorescence and can quantify how that how much of a difference um, that sample will or how how different that sample will look based off of the LAB values over time when all of that fluorescence is gone. Um, so that can be important in, in certain aspects where we're looking at you know erosion or sun damage for objects that will be outside for a long time, you know, how they're gonna differ at the end of their life cycle. Yeah. 
No, good, good and interesting um, stuff here. Um, you know, when when customers, you know, call in and, you know, their questions are around, you know, theory, you know, are, are there, you know, do you get a lot of the same frequent questions? If so, what are they and kind of how do you walk, walk those customers through those um, processes? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with, with some of the theories, I'll bring up one of the slides here, um, just the LAB system. Yeah. Um, in particular, let me pull up this one. So with the LAB system, um, it's, it's a fairly good system for, you know, quantifying where you are in color space using those, uh, those values with the LA and B. Uh, now, what you'll see is the delta E equation has changed a lot over time. The original delta E star is the equation from the 1960s. Um, but what you'll find is our eyes don't don't see exactly perfect or perfectly like this equation is set up to be. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what that means is if I'm looking at a green color, uh, this delta E will set up to where any, anything 1.5 and over would be considered um, visually different. But with a lot of colors, since our eyes are not perfect, a lot of those colors will only display, say, a difference of 0.5. But when we look at them, the two samples side by side, we'll see an obvious difference in those colors. It's because our eyes are more sensitive to um, more past. Our eyes are more sensitive to pastel colors. Uh, so, say, if you have a lighter blue uh, next yep. to another light blue, that are visually different your delta E value will be less than one, which considers it passing, but you'll find that visually they don't, they don't pass. Um, so over time, you'll find a lot of other equations that have been um, what they consider to be weighted to where they take into account how our eyes see better um, and develop these specific tolerancing for that. Okay, that helps. And, you know, I mean, a another, key aspect is just you know every person's ability to see color accurately um you know the older you get uh that the cloudier your the lens on your eyes get and that can inhibit things um also women typically see color uh, more accurately than than men do um you know it's definitely a science to do that um if anyone's interested there is a um, a test out there called the Farnsworth Munsell 100 hue test. And that will actually, you know, measure, you know, a person's ability to, you know, see color accurately. So that's a pre pretty good test. Um, so check that out uh, if you haven't heard of that. And if you're doing visual color analysis. Um, another question, I have a colorimeter that has the option of using a UV filter or not using it. Um, do you know what difference it would make in the reading, you know, either with that UV filter or without it? Um, it depends on the instrument, but I would have to say most likely if your instrument has a UV filter on it, um, what it will be looking at is the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. So I'll move to this slide here. Um, mm -hmm. So it's using that ultraviolet filter. Um, I'd have to say it depends on the instrument you have. Um, so I would say reach out to either me or John. Um, yeah. We can do some research into that instrument um, and see what exactly that UV filter is doing in that case. Yeah, here um, on this last slide in the bottom left is Noah's email. Um, me too, you can hit reply to any of the, the automated marketing messages and it'll come to my team and we'll funnel it to Noah or one of our technical experts. Um, but we, we can help you out there, Julie. Um, yeah, and other questions, keep them coming. Um, uh, just log them in the chat, we got some time. Um, other things that you're seeing out there um, pretty frequently, Noah, that you know you, you wanna touch on or um, uh, expand upon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do see quite a bit that when there's discrepancies in data between two different plants, yeah. um, 
it's most likely that they're using different setups for their instruments. Uh, I know we talked about the two degree observer and the 10 degree observer um, and the differences that you'll find in the data. So it's, it's ideal and very important that when you're comparing data with another plant or supplier that you're looking at how is your instrument set up? And that includes the aluminum, the degree observer, um, what equation you're using, if it's delta E, if it's something different, um, if you're using the LAB scale. So there's a lot of things that you have to look into to make sure that you're measuring in the same way um, if you're gonna be comparing data. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, so your data is apples to apples, um, you know, from the instrumentation set up you know, and setting side of things. But even beyond that, you have to look at your process. How is that instrument held? You know, is it held at the same angle, at the same position, you know, from one plant to another, or even from one shift to another? You're, you're, you're probably used to seeing a lot of that as well. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, different setups for different instruments, and some instruments are using circumferential illumination. Um, which means lights coming from all, all angles and other instruments are using linear illumination. So it's only coming from one side. Um, you can see differences in that um, depending on how your orientation of the instrument is on a sample. So there's a lot of things to, to be aware of when you're taking these measurements, when you're going to be comparing data and keeping data historically. Yeah. And I see, see on your slide here, effect pigments. I mean, that's a whole other ball game. You want to touch on that a little bit without overwhelming us? <laughs> yeah, so with effect pigments, it's, it's very different than, um, let's say, a solid color in that as you change the angle that you're looking at the object, the color is going to change. It's considered a color flop. Um, there's a special instrument that we have called the BICMAC that looks at these different angles. Um, and it's, it's mainly for, you know, automotive finishes or, or metallics. Uh, we're going to have these sparkle and effects, and you're also going to have these, these color flops in them. Um, so it's a, it's a whole other topic to dive into. Yeah. But to get an idea, it's, it's essentially solid color measurement, but at a, a couple other different angles um, in order to quantify how you're going to be visually seeing these in real life. Yeah. And that and that's a multi-angle instrument, right? And that measures exactly. five angles. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Good, good, good. So it probably depends too on, you know, customer specification and, and meeting that and what, what you need at your facility if you're a, a supplier, um, you know, to, to produce and ship, you know, on target, on color, on spec. Uh, Samples. Samples. Yep, exactly. Good. So what else out there, folks? Other questions? Um, like I said, we're recording this immediately following, you know, you'll receive an automated message with the link. Uh, feel free to forward that to colleagues. Um, look at it later. Take some screen. If you want a screenshot of any of these slides, just throw it in the, the chat. I, we can scroll up to it and you can grab that or, or grab it out of the recording. Um, I think next month we have, um, appearance theory. So that goes hand in hand. We always try and do color and appearance, you know, together. Um, if you think of questions after the fact, uh, never hesitate to hit reply on any of the marketing messages you, rec you receive. Um, you know, the team here will funnel it to, um, Noah or the appropriate, uh, you know, technical specialist in, in your region. Um, you know, just one thought if we're waiting for a couple more um, questions to come in. I just I just threw in the chat here. Um, you know, if, if you haven't been out to BICInstruments.com, um, especially take a look at the knowledge area. I think it's under support. Um, I, I put the direct link in there. Feel free to, to copy that. But there's a lot of articles in there, um, you know, getting into, you know, color theory and going beyond what we discussed today. Um, but also, you know, market and industry specific, uh, articles, articles about, um, about everything. And I know we have a, a pretty aggressive 
plan to add uh, more to that. Uh, so, so stay tuned, keep coming back. Um, and it's a wealth of knowledge. If, if there are things, topics that you want to hear about that we don't have, you know, you can reach out to me um, or, you know, hit reply to the marketing messages and uh, we can either get a webinar set up and developed for you, um, you know, start working on a white paper um, and get you that information. So we have just a couple minutes left. Um, any final words, Noah? We can end a little bit early unless a couple more questions come in here. You can get a couple minutes back. Yeah, final words. Um, I would say, you know, just to reiterate, you know, uh, you need three things in order to visually see a color. You need a standard illuminant. Um, you need the object, and the object has us. Uh, you know, certain properties depending on what type of color, uh, or solid color or metallic color or special effect color it is. Um, and you also need to make sure that your observer is within your specified spec. So whether that be two degree observer or 10 degree observer, um, you, you want to make sure you have everything set up in your instruments in order to measure color. Or I don't want to say the correct way, but the best way for your type of application. Yeah, you know, it's important to have all these settings set up correctly. That way, um, when you, if you ever have to compare data with someone else or with another plant or manufacturer, um, you're looking at apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Yep. Yep. Good. And uh, you know, never hesitate to reach out to Noah, myself, um, anyone in marketing. Um, we have, you know, technical folks around the country, around the globe, actually, uh, that can help you out. If you're having any questions about a, a certain process, how to improve, how to do things differently, just to verify what you're doing is, is correct and, and recommended, um, never hesitate to reach out. We're, we're always here to help you and to, to streamline things and make your facilities more efficient. Um, so with that, I, I think we'll we'll wrap it up here. You can get a little time left in your day here um, to go get an extra cup of coffee or something. Um, with that, we, we look forward to seeing you on, on future uh, BIC Instruments webinars. And thank you uh, for your participation and attendance today. Um, we appreciate you and uh, have a great rest of your day.